This is going to be a study on the subject of can Satan give life or can Satan create life? In the Bible, we see that God is the creator. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, your creator is God. Isaiah 40 and 28 says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, feigneth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. Isaiah 43, 15 says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. God is the Creator. Genesis 2, 7 says, God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Job 26, 13 says, His hands hath formed the crooked serpent. Colossians 1, 16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And then Genesis 1, 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. If there was no God, then nothing would be here. He is the only being who can create something out of nothing. He formed man out of the dust of the ground, but he also made the dust. And Revelation 4.11 says, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created for his pleasure. However, there are some things that were created not by God and not for his pleasure. And while the devil can't create something out of nothing, according to the scriptures, he can give life to something that is already there. And this is only because God allows him to. I'm not giving any glory to the devil. I'm not saying he even comes close to the powers of God. He's nothing compared to God. God could snap him, his fingers and he could just vanish out of existence. But there are times in the Bible where the devil is, was allowed to use other people to bring forth life from something. But example number one is in Exodus 7, 8 through 12. And it says, The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did as the Lord had commanded, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. These will be the devil's people. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So Moses threw down his rod, it became a serpent. And then uh, the magicians threw down their rod and they became a serpent. So Satan was allowed to give life to a rod by making it a snake. And while the rods of Janese and Jambres didn't have life, through the powers of Satan, they were turned into living, breathing serpents. However, the life from Satan shortly thereafter led to death. And that's key. The life that Satan gives can never lead to something good. It will always lead to death. And this same truth runs throughout the Bible. And we see it in our lives as well. Because the pleasures of sin only last for a season. Satan can give life to what may seem like a boring existence. But the end thereof is death. Romans 6.21 says, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Getting drunk, fornicating, lying, cheating, stealing, and every other sin may bring a spark or excitement to give life to a boring existence. Sin is pleasurable to sinful flesh, but the end of those things are death. And in the story, in the book of Exodus, Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And this pictures how the Lord is going to swallow up his enemies in his wrath. All the death and sin in our satanic enemies 
are going to be swallowed up by the Lord Jesus Christ and be no more. Isaiah 25, 8 says, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all, of all faces, and the rebuke of His people shall they take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. One day Jesus Christ is going to swallow up everything that bothers His people. Psalms 21, 8 and 9 says, Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Jesus Christ is going to get be the one who takes out vengeance. So an example number one, the counterfeit life. Satan's ministers were giving life to the rod. And this was allowed by God. They created life out of something that was already there. This life only ended in death. Now let's look at satanic life. Example number two. In Exodus 8 verses 2 through 7. And if thou refuse to let them go. Behold I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And listen to this. And the river shall bring forth. Notice that phrase bring forth frogs abundantly. Which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up, both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt, and Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. So these satanic magicians covet the power of God, similar to Simon the sorcerer in the book of Acts. They were used by Satan to bring forth counterfeit life again. You say, well, it doesn't say they created the frogs. But look at verse 3. At that phrase I pointed out earlier, it says, And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly. What does the phrase bring forth, bring forth remind you of? In Genesis 1.20, it says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. By the power of God, life was created through Moses and his rod. God used them to bring forth life out of the waters, similar to how God allowed Satan to use the devilish magicians to also bring forth counterfeit life. Since Pharaoh used to let the, used to let the children of Israel go, it caused him to be plagued by frogs, since he refused to let them go. Frogs are a picture of unclean spirits in the Bible, and Revelation 16.13 talks about unclean spirits like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the, of the beast. And unclean spirits walk through dry places, seeking rest and finding none, as the Bible says, and they, are, they like wet places. They like getting in people. And a devil-possessed boy in the Gospels was oftentimes cast into the fire and into the water. Moses and the magicians, bringing up frogs, a type of unclean spirits against Pharaoh, goes to show that constant rebellion and hardening against God will result in God allowing further devilish influence because God used the frogs to plague the hardened Pharaoh who will use lying spirits. God will use lying spirits to plague a rebellious people and bring further judgment on that people. In 1 Kings twenty two twenty three, it says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. A nation like America in a rebellion against God is home to a bunch of money-hungry false prophets who deceive the people with their lying spirit. God used the frogs, similar to how he uses lying spirits. Also note that Satan, Satan's frogs, he also uses lying unclean spirits himself. So when you rebel, you don't just have God allowing lying spirits to deceive God will also let Satan deceive you and plague you even more. Satan will cause even more unclean spirits to come your way. Satan doesn't work in your favor. 
the magicians bringing up more frogs than the earth didn't help the matter. Also take note of what happened to the frogs in Exodus 8.13. They died. Notice the life from Satan always leads to death. God's let these reprobate magicians know that they aren't God. In Exodus 8, 16 through 19, when he doesn't allow them to turn the dust into lice like Moses did. In Exodus 8, 19, it says, Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. God formed man out of the dust of the ground. The magicians couldn't even turn dust into lice. And they had to admit the finger of God was involved when Moses turned the dust into lice. Satanic and occult powers are nothing compared to God. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were counted ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers. Simon the sorcerer knew he was nothing compared to the disciples. He wanted the power of the Holy Ghost and attempted to buy it with money. So these magicians can't, pair, can't compare to the men of God. Now let's look at the third example of satanic counterfeit life. In Revelation thirteen eleven through 14, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which rather in to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword, and did live. Revelation thirteen fifteen says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So here you have the false prophet giving life unto the image of the beast. The beast is the Antichrist. The tables are being set for people to worship an image. And notice verse 15 says that he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So this should convince any skeptic about what I'm teaching. You have to deny the words of God to teach that only God gives life in the Bible. Here Satan does it through the false prophet. Keeping in mind God allowed it and he could stop it if he wanted to. And we're not giving the devil any glory. He can only do anything because God is allowing it. A lot of people get the wrong idea when you talk about these things and they start to get all self-righteous and ultra-spiritual and want to attack. They think you are trying to give Satan too much credit or making him equal with God. That's not happening here. That's not what I'm doing. Satan only can do what he does because God lets him do it. Satan can't even be compared to the powers of God. God has more power over the devil than a human does an ant. Uh, the verse is clear. The false prophet, the second beast, will have power to give life. And what is significant about this is that people will be deceived into believing the Antichrist and the false prophet. They'll be deceived into believing these men are God because they resurrect and they have power to give life. And they won't be able to comprehend the fact that Satan can also give counterfeit life. The creepy thing about all this is that he is going to give life to dead matter. Whether it is a statue, a 3D picture on a screen, or an AI robot. A lot of this robot stuff may be leading up to this image. They have robots who look just like humans. And they can create a robot that looks just like an antichrist. These images could be mass produced and put in your home even. And people are already putting robots in their home like Alexa. And you have seen in movies like iRobot where people have a live live, live in robot. And then the robots turn and attack the humans. Sometimes it seems like God makes Satan give a warning before he goes through with one of his evil plots. And I believe he uses the music industry and the movie industry to do so. And although we have saved people who aren't going to be here during the future time period, which is us, born-again believers, we're not going to be here where the Antichrist will be worshipped. 
it is still possible for us to worship an image, even if it is our own image. And some Christians are so in love with keeping their image that they are ashamed of the gospel. Some Christians will worship an iPhone. If you spend more time on your iPhone than you do in the Bible, it can be an idol. A good solution is to download a Bible app on your iPhone. Then you can do both. However, there is nothing like having a black leather Bible in your lap that actually has pages that you can turn. But I believe there is modern day counterfeit life going on in cloning. I don't believe cloning is of God. It is scientists or whoever trying to play God and create counterfeit life. They are mixing things that God didn't intend to have mixed. And God wasn't for mixing. He wanted humans to produce with humans, cattle with cattle, creeping thing with creeping thing. If you read Genesis 1, he says in verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind, and cattle and creeping thing, and the beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. So he wants it to be after his kind, not mixing the kinds together. Mixing human DNA with animals to create a freakish creature is satanic. Transhumanism is also satanic. Creating superhumans through technology is not of God. Men are trying to get glorified bodies without coming to Jesus Christ to get the glorified bodies. Sure, they may be able to prolong their life, for a while by the use of technology, but even if they add 200 years, that is nothing compared to eternity. If you get saved, then you will get an everlasting glorified body at the rapture. Satan gets the idea of transhumanism from Ezekiel chapter 1. Satan reads the Bible and knows it better than any 1,000 Bible teachers put together. In Ezekiel chapter 1, a spirit lives in a machine. Exodus one twenty through 21 says, Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Tither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. The same way these spirits inhabited this wheel... An unclean spirit can inhabit an animal or a cloned creature or an AI robot or a mixture of a human with a robot. Ever heard the phrase, ghost in the machine? The average Christian thinks all this stuff is a sci-fi fantasy. They have a hard time believing anything they haven't heard before. And they have seen so many movies that anything out of the ordinary seems like a fairy tale. But the evidence is there. You can look up how they're making these AI robots that are very lifelike. And you can look up how they they can put robotic limbs on people, mixing humans with machine. And then you can read the Bible and see how unclean spirits possess animals, people, and then the image of the beast. So a... A uh, robot can be possessed by a devil. That would be a ghost in the machine. But the last example I'll give of counterfeit life is in Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, 1 through 4, it says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Notice it shows a distinction by saying sons of God and daughters of men. Sons of God and daughters of men. In the Old Testament, the term sons of God is used exclusively for angels. And Psalms 82, 6 and 7 says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Notice it says, ye are gods and children of the Most High. Then it says, but ye shall die like men. Why would it say this unless these gods really weren't men? 
None of the saints in the Old Testament were sons of God because they hadn't been born again. No one is born again until the New Testament. Jesus hadn't even died yet for it to be possible to get born again. And Jesus Christ was the first begotten. He was the first person born of God. Uh, the difference between us and Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ was born physically of God in the, in, in the flesh. The Holy Spirit uh, conceived through Mary and produced Jesus Christ. We come about through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and that's how we become a child of God. And Adam was called a son of God in Luke 3.38. But this is in a genealogy. And he didn't have an earthly father. That's why Adam is called the son of God in Luke 3.38. But he wasn't called the son of God in the Old Testament. That, that title was exclusively used for angels in the Old Testament. But Adam was called a son of God because he didn't have an earthly father. And Christians are sons of God because they were adopted into the family of God at salvation. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. The angels and Adam are sons of God because they are direct creations of God. Let's look at more verses that prove this. In Job 1.6 it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. In Job 1.6 the sons of God come with Satan to present themselves before the Lord. They are going to end up talking about Job. If the sons of God are safe people. Or the godly line of Seth. As people well meaningly teach. Then why are they appearing with Satan? If these are just safe people in the third heaven with God. What are they doing in heaven? Shouldn't they be in paradise. Waiting on Jesus Christ to shed his blood. And make it possible for them to have a home in the third heaven. So to teach that these sons of God are safe people, you will have to, number one, teach that men were born again in the Old Testament. You will have to also teach that they went to the third heaven at death instead of paradise in the heart of the earth. Ask yourself this. Most of you believe that men went to paradise in the Old Testament because Jesus hadn't shed his blood yet. If that's true, then what are these saved, so-called saved people doing in the third heaven? With Satan and God. And there are people who. Deny any form of dispensationalism. That will teach that there was no. Paradise in the heart of the earth. In the Old Testament. That men just went directly to the third heaven. And they will also teach that men were born again. In the Old Testament. So you're going to have to pretty much ditch dispensationalism. To call these sons of God saved people. In the third heaven. Because you're going to have to believe. That men were born again in the Old Testament. And you're going to have to believe that men. Went to the third heaven at death. Instead of paradise. And if that's what you want to believe. That's fine with me. I respect people's belief. Just like I hope they will respect mine. But I don't believe that that's right. According to the Bible. And if you're still not convinced. Of who the sons of God are in the Old Testament. Then turn to Job 38, 4 through 7. It says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. In these verses you have God asking Job questions. He says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? The answer is, Job hadn't even been born yet. And the verses are teaching that man wasn't around during the creation, but the morning stars and the sons of God were around. And if the sons of God are safe people, or some type of godly line of Seth, then how were they here when God laid the foundations of the earth, before Adam was even born, before Seth was even born? If, it's the, if the sons of God are the godly line of Seth, then how were these sons of God here before Adam was even born? Those who teach sons of God are safe people will say the cornerstone in verse 6 is referring to Jesus Christ. It is true that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, but does this go along with the context 
of Job 38. Read it again. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? What are you saying? That Jesus was created when God laid the foundations? Are you saying that Jesus is a created God or something? I don't understand that. It is true that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. But is, th is that the cornerstone that's referred to in Job 38? That seems like a stretch. And many will use Hebrews 1.5 to prove the angels can't be sons of God. And they want to remove part of the verse to teach it. In Hebrews 1.5 it says, For unto the which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So what they'll do is, they're so against the sons of God being angels, that they'll say that no angel has ever been called a son. And they'll go to Hebrews 1, five, where it says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. But he isn't saying the angels aren't sons. He's saying they aren't begotten sons. He would never say to an angel, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, because they aren't begotten. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, as a man, is begotten. He was born of God. Angels aren't born of God, they're direct creations. So to get Hebrews 1.5 to teach that no angel is a son, they have to remove the phrase, this day have I begotten thee. And we can read it like that. In Hebrews 1, 5, it says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. And then you have to remove that, This day have I begotten thee, to teach what you're wanting to teach. So, their arguments, they're having to remove parts of the verse. So in Genesis 6, The sons of God are the angels, which kept not their first estate. They were overcome by the fairness of the women. They lusted after human women. And this is why 1 Corinthians 11, 9 through 10 talks about a woman having a man as her covering because of the angels. 1 Corinthians 11, 9 through 10 says, Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this caused ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Angels don't even look like something extraordinary when they appear. Hebrews 13.2 says you can entertain them unaware and they look just like men because they are male. Schofield says they are sexless because of Matthew 22.30 which says for in the re resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven. So which angels according to Matthew 22.30 the verse we just read which ones don't get married the angels of God in heaven. Notice the preciseness of the King James Bible. It isn't the angels which kept not their first estate that don't get married, but rather the angels of God in heaven. If the angels, if some of the angels left their first estate, then they're not the angels of God in heaven. So once again, to prove another one of their teachings, they would have to remove or disregard part of the verse. The verse would have to read, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels. And then just remove the part that says in heaven. Angels don't marry each other because they are all male. Look up the word angel in the Bible and you will find out they are never mentioned as female, only male, and definitely not sexless. It refers to them as the man or young man or young men. Notice how the Bible also likens the fallen angels to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who also committed fornication and went after strange flesh. In Jude 1, 6, or Jude has one chapter, so verses 6 through 7, it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Someone said, well, the sons of God didn't commit fornication with the daughters of men because it says they took them wives of all which they chose. When you commit fornication, you are physically married to a person. You are one flesh. In the Old Testament, there was no marriage ceremony and there was no marriage license. They were married by joining flesh. 
Isaac took Rebekah into a tent and joined flesh. She became his wife. Genesis twenty four sixty seven says, And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her as Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So fornication can make you physically married to a person. 1 Corinthians 6.16 6, says what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. The sons of God in Genesis 6 took them wives when they joined flesh to their flesh. Someone else said the sons of God couldn't have mated with human women because they are spirits. But the Bible tells us how angels can take on physical reality. They eat and they drink when they appear to Lot and when they appear to Abraham. And if these sons of God in Genesis 6 were so godly and a part of some godly line, then why did they perish in the flood? It's a contradiction. Noah is the one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The rest are referred to as ungodly, not godly. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.5 says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The godly line of Seth uh, thing was made up to try and cover up for the horrific story in the Bible when the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They cover it up for the same reasons the new Bibles take out the word dung. Because these guys are too dignified to get up and teach what it actually says. It goes down to the fact that people are uh, trying their best to get rid of this story in the scriptures for the simple reason that it is just weird. It's a weird story. And who wants to believe this ever took place? It would be a lot easier if it were just saved people marrying lost people. I mean, people think you're crazy when you say what actually happened. I kind of wish it was just saved people marrying lost people. Now, some say this teaching about the sons of God being angels only comes from the new Bibles. But no, it doesn't. That is just what your teacher told you who was trying to discredit what I'm teaching. He doesn't have enough Bible to teach otherwise or wasn't able to twist enough scripture. So he has to mock and make fun of and laugh at and find things outside of the Bible to give you to take up his view. Because he can't find anything to anything in the King James Bible to really prove against what I'm teaching. And that is why he laughs about it and makes fun of it and calls it a sci-fi fantasy. I admit this teaching is weird and it's bizarre. But look at all the other weird things we believe as Christians simply because we believe the Bible. I mean, we believe one day some Christians are going to be shopping at Walmart and then their bodies are going to change into a sinless, incorruptible body and the dead Christian bodies are going to join their soul in the air at the rapture. The Bible is a strange book. It's more than just a book about salvation and names and living right. With this long explanation out of the way, the offspring of the sons of God and daughters of men were giants. They were mighty men which were of old men of renown. They were counterfeit life. Notice that just like all the other counterfeit life, they die shortly after. God brought the flood. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So the same event must have occurred again after the flood. But that would only be speculation. While I don't believe this story is about a godly line mixing with unsaved women, we can get something practical out of this for ourselves. That is, God doesn't want things mixing together that don't go together. He doesn't want saved and lost people together. Just like their offspring ended up going bad in Genesis 6, the same is true for a relationship between a saved and lost married couple. Their kid is influenced by the unsafe parent and they will many times take on the false gods that the lost parent has. So in summary, God is the creator. He created Lucifer, yet he also allows counterfeit life. But it is life that always ends in death. Even the fallen angels who produce counterfeit life end up dying like men. In Psalms 82.
according to Psalms 82, and they are presently under darkness, in chains of darkness. The lake of fire is the second death, and that is where they are going. The true life, which is Jesus Christ, leads to eternal life. John 1, 4 says, And him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 5.24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 6.40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6.47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So Jesus Christ gives life. Satan gives death. Satan can create counterfeit life because he is allowed to by God, but all his life will lead to death. If you become alive through Jesus Christ, then you'll never die. But this has been a study on can Satan create counterfeit life.